Chella is the CEO and founder of The Repositioning Expert. She's a marketing strategist who helps professional service companies change their messaging to attract more decision makers. In her former life, Chella was an award-winning marketer at companies such as Pepsi, Pizza Hut, Frito-Lay, Diageo, Playtex, and Bic Inc. for 20 years. You knew how to say Diageo. Do you I know practice. how many people don't know how to say <laughs> Diageo? It's really funny, I, I know. But you, oh, she practiced. Now she's a marketing consultant, the author of Gentle Marketing, with the book of which I have, a way to attract loads of clients, an expert featured on major television networks such as ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, as well as a speaker at international industry conferences such as ours. Like this one, yeah. Yes. Um, and I first met Shala in Vancouver, yeah. and she was speaking on a panel of four people. And I think you were the last speaker, and I thought all the other speakers were really good until you got up Aww. and spoke. And she, it was so riveting and to the point and really lots of strategies and tactics for marketing and uh, trying to do better in our businesses. So welcome, Chella. Thank you. Well, you're totally gonna see the same presentation. So <laughs> repetition, repetition, repetition. She is, but you're not. So let's get right into it because I don't wanna keep you longer than you need to be. And because there's, we're so intimate in this group, which uh, is smaller than who I usually speak to, uh, we're going to have some chances to actually hopefully get you to do the talking. I hope that's okay. And I may put you on the spot or not for if you're shy. And you know, it's, it's weird because I, I am shy. I know you can't tell that, but my mother apparently used to force me to go to the corner store and just to, I was so shy and she would like follow me, which I didn't know. So, and now like I'm on national TV, so it's weird. It's weird. So, but I still have to push myself. So push yourselves and you could do the same as me. So thank you for those of you who entered uh, to win. There's chocolate in here, I promise you, and then my book, Gentle Marketing, which will do the draw. What maybe Laura can help me at the end. And um, here's my story. After working for 20 years at these giant corporations, now how many of you currently work for giant corporations or in the past worked for cor giant corporations? Okay. Well. There, it's a different animal, let me tell you. So for 20 years, 18 years, I was, you know, the person saying, no, thank you, screening calls, you know, not taking calls, and rejecting about 90% of the vendors that came to me. So now, you know, it's been five, six years that I'm on the other side of the table where I'm the one who is being, no, thank you, no, thank you. How many of you are in sales? Okay, good. So this is the right crowd that gets rejected. You understand <laughs> exactly what I'm talking about. So all the work that I do today is to try to get that rejection to be um, less frequent for you guys, for your message to be able to open more doors, for your message to be able to stick more. But I have to tell you, I have to take it all the way and you know, um, destroy everything you know and then build it from the ground. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that. So when I first started, so imagine 18 years of saying no to everyone and then I started my own business and I'm freaking out. I don't know how I'm gonna get clients because I have my own business. So what I did to market myself was I did everything they told me to. I was a good student, so I did trade shows, networking. How many of you do networking? Just about everyone, yeah. Um, social media, oh my God, if I didn't have a social media person on my team, I was like, you know, what are you doing? And uh, webinars, I learned how to do webinars. I can do webinars till the cows come home, and still do. I hired a coach, but I, because I was new, I hired a group coach. So I went into this group, I thought, oh, I'm gonna get so much, so many clients, I'm gonna learn so much. And then I subscribed to a virtual program with another coach. So I was like, I've got everything ready. And guess what happened? Sorry, I forgot SEO. SEO was also the big, big trendy thing. Oh, if you're not on Google first page, you are never going to get hired. So I did the SEO. So for two months, it was crickets. Nothing happened. I was having nightmares every night. And I, I talk about this on the television segments. I am doing a... Um, a book tour, it's not this book, 
it's another book, but in the US, and uh, I talk about entrepreneurship. And you know, I used to have nightmares every night on the clock. I could tell you, my, I would wake my husband and say, you know, I know you're sleeping, but you know, I'm having another nightmare. It was like clockwork, and it was because none of this was working. And I've heard that if, you know, if that doesn't stop, like it can get into psychosis and it starts to manifest in your body and stuff. So thank God I took stock. And what I did was I, at first, I resisted changing my course because I'd paid all this money to the SEO and the coaches and the programs and the this and the that, right, and the social media. And then I stopped doing the trendy stuff. And then I applied what I, I thought about, oh my God, I've been marketing these sexy brands for 20 years. What the hell is wrong with me? Why can't I learn from what they've been doing right in and, and put it into my business? And the results, ta-da! <laughs> I don't know if you can see, but those are my guys. I tripled my 20-year corporate salary. And that was in, in three years of having a business. And that was pretty good. Because all I wanted to do was just make the same money. Because that's all I wanted to do. Now I dream my dream car. It has three letters. My husband hates it. Uh, that's OK, though. I still like it. It's good um, on snow. My little guy, ha he's on the spectrum of autism. But he's really high functioning. But he still has a lot of needs. So I'm able to first afford like all his needs and a private school, but also able to take him to all the events that we need to take him to um, for additional help and education. And then I, you know, um, my husband works in Georgetown. If you're out of town, you don't know where that is, but it's, it's far. So I, I can surprise him, like I have my flexible schedule. Last year I got addicted to going to the gym. Um, so that I take, like I'm in the gym two hours a day. So these are the things that I can afford while making three times what I used to make, that was me. Sorry, sorry camera guy. Um, and then I pick and choose, so this is probably one of the best ones. Um, I just met a colleague from my last employer, Bic, who I worked with seven years, and he's like, don't, tell, don't be telling bad stories about Bic in this room. <laughs> and I said, don't worry. <laughs> I, had a good, I had good times with Bic, but uh, there were times in when I worked for those giant corporations that I did not like who I was working with, and I didn't respect, I, I thought I knew more than my boss. So that was probably one of the biggest things that you know, having my own business and being able to have my own business because I could get clients did for me is that I no longer had to work with people who like just their bodies were there, but their you know they were gone. So why don't expensive marketing fads and programming work? How many of you think your uh, corporate marketing gets you clients versus you? How many of you think your marketing lines up the leads for you? <laughs> I know it's sad. I know I can tell you that. So let me tell you why, and maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong. How many of you have ever built a home or added an addition? Yeah, it's, what's the first thing that you need? And yeah, you're kind of getting the answer here, but um, I live here in Etobicoke, and on our street, every single house has put on a t double uh, second story. And the first thing that you need if you're going to put on a second story is what? <laughs> yeah. No, you can get that from the bank. Well, yeah, and what is the architect, like the, what the, the city, yeah, the city won't even give you a permit to before you have a blueprint, right? And the blueprint tells you, you can't even go out and hire people like a contractor or anybody else after without a, a blueprint. And yet, because it tells you, well, where is the room going to go? How big is it going to be? And so on. Because if you were to say, I don't have a blueprint, and you, would, you were to go to your contractor or to your landscaper and say, hey, can you, uh, you know, like, I don't have a blueprint. I didn't pay for one. So can you just sort of guess at it? And can you just tell me how to, you know, can we just make one ourselves? Well, guess what? What the house would look like would be probably like this, right? And it's because that's what exactly what businesses are doing. They're not, they're asking the people who, are, who come after the blueprint what to do. And because these people are all, you know, they want to make a living and they, they want to help you, they try to make the blueprint for you. And I'm going to tell you what that means for business. So in business, you're asking web designers, SEO experts, speaking coaches, and in some cases, you guys, companies are expecting the sales reps to know what the blueprint of the company is. And when I say 
the blueprint, what am I talking about? Does anybody know what the blueprint of a business should be? A business plan. And what does a business plan include? Who are we going to target? So that's number one, right? Who are we going to target? Number two is what problem do we solve? And number three is why are we different? Like these are the things, like why should you be figuring that out? The blueprint, so the architects of the business strategy need to figure that one out. And they need to figure it out not by guessing. They need to figure it out by doing market research. So then they need to give you the messaging to go out and fight the fight. And they need to give you the tools and the right tools that open the doors and the right tools that don't get hung up on and the right tools that actually, once you're in the meeting, actually sticks to the buyer. Those are the right tools that marketing needs to be giving you. And having worked all my life in marketing, I can tell you many, many, many companies don't work with a blueprint. And the people who are trying to make the blueprint are not even qualified in some cases to be making the blueprint because they're not even really um, business architects. So to give you all that horrible news, I'm going to teach you what that could look like. And I'm going to show you some examples. OK, so the four steps to opening more doors and closing more sales is sharpen your positioning. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Strategically picking a vertical, this one you guys are going to hate because you're in this industry and it's like, I will sell to everyone. And then the third one is base your messaging on the target's pain. We'll go into that. And then the fourth one is use out of the box ways to intercept some key decision makers. And I found some examples in your industry, so it was really interesting. So sharpen your positioning. Let me tell you about the story. And the thing is, I'm going to be telling you stories all day today. Well whatever, however long we have. Um, because by the, if I were just to give you facts, by the time the statistics show, by the time you get to your car or to the cab, you'll have forgotten 90% of what I've told you. But if I tell you stories, there's a much higher retention. In fact, what's even better is if I actually start doing demos with you guys. I don't know if we'll have time for that, but working on your business, your messaging one-on-one. -on -one. So that's how the learning curve goes. I'll tell you about the story. This was a language school, a client who had a language school. And when you think about language schools who sell to corporations, who do you think about? Is there any name that comes to mind? Berlitz. Berlitz. Very good, yeah. So she was, she was a smaller company and competing with the Berlitzes. Well, when we looked at, when we did the research, we figured out, well, what is the one thing that you, you can be different in? Again, there's nothing different about her. Just like you guys, one of the biggest problems in your industry is there's nothing different about you. It's the tchotchkes and the things that are different, right? Maybe. But even then, a pen's a pen's a pen, right? So what we made different about her, oh, uh, oh excuse me, yeah, and oh my gosh, and I, I was this stationary category manager. Um, so the language school, the, the research became, has anybody ever had to work with somebody in a different market who speaks a different language, even if it's Quebec? It's not their native language. OK. Cause, can you tell me what the problem was? Translation. <laughs> well, and it's, it's even further than word translation. It's cultural. It's cultural. They piss each other off <laughs> because there is a huge disconnect. And in fact, it's a huge problem. Now there's a huge disconnect between translation between you know, Gen X, Gen Y, millennials. And th there's a huge, huge you know, um, HR issue there. But so what we did is we repositioned them as the cultural language training for, and the, the vertical that our research indicated was mining companies, because they often have to work like with, in South America, let's say, and they send one email, piss off the whole team, and everything slows down. So that's what they became positioned as. Um, here's another example. This was the before picture of the client where this was a leadership uh, coaching company. You can see the name of the company was Insight Coaching and Consulting. Has anybody ever worked with manufacturing companies of 100 to 300 people? What's their number one leadership problem? Do you, can you guess? I know they have so many, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, that's, it's, it's one of them. But so apparently, when we did the research, we found out that the number one problem is decision making. <laughs> nobody's making decisions, especially at the mid-level. So if nobody's making decisions at a manufacturer, guess what happens? <laughs> right, it's slow. <laughs> Again, productivity slows down. So what did she, she become positioned as? The problemsolvingleader.com, 
and creating fearless decision makers became the uh, tagline. So do you see how you go from generic, saying what everybody's saying, to very uh, specific, positioned about a very specific issue? Here's another one. This was, um, the client was a wine event planner. And when we did the research, we found out that in the industry of the financial wealth managers, what is the number one problem that she could solve? Any idea? In the financial, think about your wealth advisor, you probably have one. What's the problem that a wine event planner would solve for her, for, for the wealth advisors? Client retention, right? We didn't know that, I would never have known that, she would never have known that, but we did the research, just like how I used to do when I used to work for Pepsi, Pizza Hut, Frito-Lay. So then she became a retention expert. And who saw me with her speaking on the same panel was Laura at the and is it it's completely unheard of that a wine event planner would be asked to speak at a business conference had she not had that positioning. And we did not come up with that positioning by guessing. We came up with it as an actual business need in a very specific niche. Does that make sense? Because we did the, the research. Oh, I'm going to have my coffee, sorry. My cold coffee. Oh, they, they brought the coffees back. That's great. Okay, so pick the right vertical. Now, I know this goes against everything you know. I'd like to find out with a show of hands, how many of you, how many of your companies actually do industry-specific targeting? Oh, one guy in the back, nice. Really? Oh, I'm so impressed. I'm so glad. That is really good news. So, sir, in the back, <laughs> that I, <laughs> I know, I, I made this guy move. Um, tell us about that. Um, what is the industry that you, you um, focus on? Is it many? And then what do you do around that? I'm going to bring the walking mic, if that's okay. Um, actually, we focus on various vertical markets, probably four or five. Okay. Um, hospitality being one banking and finance, mm -hmm. the automotive industry, and there's a couple of others. But what we find is when we are focused on the vertical markets at that point, we become more relevant in that space. Uh -huh. And then not only the relevance takes place, but it also expands beyond our current local market where your name become, can become viral in that space. Uh -huh. Wow. Okay, I think I can go home now. He's just made my case. He's just made my whole point. Do you have a specific marketing plan and messaging around each different vertical? We do. Yes, okay. Well, he's... Actually, actually the, oh. I'm sorry. Actually, go for it. Uh, if you were go to the people that I work with, if you go to their web pages, everything focuses, for instance, it might say that we focus on these five vertical markets. When you click that vertical market at the top, when you go to that page, everything on that page is related specifically to that vertical market. Very it's nice. not confusing. All the videos, everything is all engaging and speaks to that Love point it. specifically. And do you want to do a plug? Where do you work? Um, no. Oh, I want you to do a plug. No, I'm good. I'm well, good. I'm gonna read it. No, no, well, no, no, no. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> oh, we're not supposed to. Okay, no, fine. No, that's right. Well, I want to. I want to go look at it though, because and I'm gonna uh, probably show it as an example if we have time. No, I love it. Okay, all right. So that's what I've been trying to convince you to do. So if you're convinced, then we don't have to do any more. It works, everyone. Okay, I'm gonna show you some examples. I'm just gonna get my cell, just to make sure. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna give you an out of industry uh, story. So this was an ad agency called Kick, and they, were, they literally went bankrupt in 2009. She had to send all the employees home, take all the furniture out of the you know, Brampton warehouse, um, and put it in her basement, and that was it. The business went into her basement. And uh, because they were generic, and the reason for that was, well, there was a, a hit to the economy, and all of her clients stopped doing uh, displays, like cardboard displays. And when we did the research, we found out that the number one thing that she could niche in that was the biggest opportunity was called inbound marketing. Does anybody know what that means? Anybody, yeah? Explain it to a two-year-old. Anybody want to? No? Okay. Um, it's when you fire your sales staff, sorry, and then you can get uh, leads from online, just your online marketing. 
And so that's what they would do for companies. Not that they would fire their sales staff, but you know, actually that was the name of their um, keynote, which was really well done. So then the vertical was food service manufacturers. Again, it wasn't just picked out of a hat. There was actual research done to figure that out. Now, did it work, do you think? Well, here is an email I got from the founder um, very quickly afterwards. Hey guys, I called X Foods today and spoke with the director of marketing for food service. At first he turned me down, but as soon as I said we specialize in this field, his ears perked up, he wouldn't stop talking. And they actually got this uh, account. So why do you need a vertical, just like the gentleman in the back said, who shall remain nameless and anonymous, apparently? So this is my, um, my marketing plan for clients. So it's a metaphor, and the, the metaphor is your customer's son and the worldview of your target. So imagine putting the, your target market, which is the vertical and whoever you're targeting in that vertical, so whether it's you know, the secretary, the admin, or the purchasing uh, manager, whoever it is. Put, so this one was done for food and beverage and the CXO was the target, so CMO, CFO. And for a B2C targeting, we use lifestyle. But because yours is mostly B2B, we'll go to what publications is that person reading? What um, podcasts are they listening to? What social media are they engaged in? So then you look at, okay, what organizations and associations do they belong to? Then you go to what meetings, trade shows, conferences are they at? what other professionals they work with so that you can joint venture with them, and who is your competition that targets them but offers something slightly different that you can partner with. And I'll show you some examples of that. So this is, so for example, I work with a company in Vancouver, which I, I won't name, uh, who have 13 sales reps I work with, and we're working on five of these verticals, five sons. So we have five sons, and we're, we've developed copy, and we've developed content, and we've developed um, the sun, which is a marketing plan for each different vertical. Now, if you don't have a big enough company that is able to do that, then prioritize which vertical by figuring out which one has the most dollar potential, the quickest dollar potential. So there's a way to do all that. Okay. So here is an example, Bargains Group is, uh, Jody's a friend in Toronto, and you know, their vertical, look at how, I, and they, she'll be the last one to tell you that they've done this um, strategically, but it, she's done it out of her heart, but they clearly target non-for-profits. It's in everything she does. They have a uh, you know, street person rescue kit program that she, they sleep on the streets in the winter, you know, with all her other CEOs of her clients, like she is all over it. And it's because she fell into this because it's her heart. But when I talk to her about the strategy and the niching and the targeting, she's like, don't talk to me about that. Talk to me about my heart. So it's niching, but, and it's being a specialist, but by, you know, accident. But it works for them. They're very successful. Um, for multiple pillars, and unfortunately I don't have uh, this gentleman's website, but this is what it looks like for Salesforce. You can put the industries and you can speak to each industry um, in your website and speak to all of their issues, just like what he was saying. Now the third secret is use pain-based messaging. Um, did you know that 70% of human beings make purchasing decisions based on pain and only 30% to improve something? So if you're not talking about a problem, they're not going to hear you. In fact, I was talking to um, one of the gyms I'm addicted to is the Humber Gym on Lakeshore. And I was talking to the, to the media guy who also, you know, part-times as the trainer. And he said that they have such a huge issue filling events for students where they give stuff away for free. He said, they're free. The events are free. And then we're giving away like a boatload of stuff for free. And nobody is coming. Because people are so overwhelmed by information. And they're so overwhelmed by hearing the same thing over and over again. So the only, and I told him about this. I said, did you know that if you talk about their problems, so you talk about, acne or whatever, you know, like young people problem. You talk about are you out of town and lonely or you talk about you can't find a date. I don't know what Humber students' problems are, but you talk about their problems and you position the event for that problem. 
you're done, right? So let me show you how that works for businesses. So here was a client um, before the, the repositioning. So it was called GR Marketing Strategists. Again, you know, I can almost tell you when I go on to, and I went on to quite a few uh, of not your websites, but of the industry websites, and um, pretty much most of them were all the same. And so his was very generic as well. And he, he's a, um, uh, a marketing strategist, similar to me. And he said, the heart of your business success lies in its marketing and distribution. And um, I actually met this guy through my first client, Kick. And I met him at her event, and I thought he was a little bit creepy. So I, I was like kind of running away from him. But it turned out he was like this amazing gentleman, and he, he uh, like the nicest guy. He just um, emailed me today. And he rescues Jack Russells from the street by driving at 3 AM in the morning to the US border to rescue them. Like, I mean, he's such a great guy. Even the Jack Russells are escaping. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> I know, it's so sad. So then when we did the research, we found out that the pain that this guy could solve was for small food manufacturers. So, um, you know, the sauces and the cookies, well, their number, who's ever worked in the food industry? Like, yeah, what's their number one problem? They can't get into stores, right? They can't get listed. And when they do get listed, will they get kicked out, which is like goodbye listing fees, right? So. He became, and this is like so dark, I don't know why the projector's so dark, but um, he's actually Caucasian. I don't know if you can see that, but it, and that's, nor, that's not really relevant, but what he does is he gets you marketing to get you listed, and in fact, the name of the company changed to fooddistribution.com, and he went from having zero non-referred business uh, the year before to 16 new contracts after his repositioning, and so, that's, that's the problem he solves, is you want to get listed and stay listed in grocery stores. So I take uh, credit for the fact that at the age of 61, he asked his girlfriend to marry him, because I think he got so like confident. So anyway, he invited me to the wedding, and that's us at the wedding. <laughs> and everyone thinks it's like I was getting married, but no, I, I'm, I wasn't wearing white. So then, at, you know, <laughs> shortly after, what I got an email after the wedding, and um, he said, I'm pretty, oh, and he talked about me in the, in the speech, which I was about to leave because I went to the wedding by myself because my husband was at the Formula One. And he's a, anyway, he was in Montreal. So if you ever think um, going to a wedding alone is like networking, it's not. It was terrifying. I was the only person alone. And I tried to, you know, walk up to people like you do in networking and talk to people. But people were all in pairs and they were not willing to talk to me. It was terrible. Anyway, so I said, you know, um, can't tell you how touched I was by your mention. Loved your bride, Teresa. And thanks for inviting me. We'll do a couple's night. And then he said, uh, keep your fingers crossed. I'm pretty confident. I just closed my 15K package in a week. I'm trying to do a conference call, blah, blah. And then I said, oh, so proud of you. This marriage is really good for you. And he goes, no, <laughs> this is all based upon our conversation. So I was like, well, I tried. So um, here's another client. Again, remember, it's all about pain, 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 right? Nine out of 10 food supply manufacturers uh, were delayed in getting national brand orders, which cost them 250 grand a year. That's her messaging. And on her website, the same page, if you look down, she actually offers a solution for that. So imagine if you're talking to industries and you're offering them a very specific solution for their pain that you can solve. So then I looked at your industry and I found this company for imprint. Is that anybody has anybody heard of them? No. Are, yeah. Is anybody from there? No. no. Okay. Why are you giggling, sir? Okay, why are you smiling? It looks like you're gonna break into a gig. They're big. Yeah, they're huge. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know. I don't know anything about them except they were uh, rated the top um, promotional products supplier in the U.S. And I looked at their website and I liked it because it. Well, guess what? It talks about pain. It talks about their target's pain. No worries. I've got this tight deadline. Looking for the perfect product. No problem. We're here to make it happen. Now, if you're industry specific, you might have different messaging for the pain of that industry, which I would love to see, which I'm gonna apparently go to that gentleman's secret website to go to do. Um, here's another one that I found. 
I liked it again. It's called IMS. Has anybody heard of this? This, is, this was again on that big, big top list. IMS clients seek cost savings and process efficiencies. We deliver both. So I thought, you know, it's not the greatest, but it's got some sort of pain. This one I love. I've actually met this woman. Does anybody know J, J, J E? It's J actually, J A E. That's her name. So that's the name. J, okay, oh. She's here now? Oh my God. Hi. I love what you're doing. We met um, two years ago in an executive roundtable that we've done. And, and you've done a lot since. And uh, I congratulate you. And so it's so fortunate that everything good that I'm going to say is about you. It's, good, it's true. I'm not lambasting or anything. So what I liked about this is we create high impact branding and deliver peace of mind. But they've taken um, addressing the pain e even further into the next page. They have a, an idea box page, which they've got the challenge. And, and I learned stuff. And I don't even work in your industry. But I learned new ideas on how to do this. And I thought, what an amazing way to market based on pain. Is this making sense to you guys? Yeah, is this helping? The stories are helping? OK. Then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you some out of the box outreach. So how many of you? have tried to reach a decision maker um, without calling them or having been already introduced to them? Without calling them or having been introduced to them? OK. How did you do it? LinkedIn. OK. But, oh, so you messaged them? Yeah, I just found out who they were. OK. Very good. And it worked. And it worked. Yeah. Awesome. And what did you say in the message? Uh, well, this was oh, sorry. Was sorry, you can't hear her. Go ahead. It was a customer or a brand that I had worked with in the past, but the person that I worked with was gone, and I didn't know who was the right contact anymore. Um, so I found them on LinkedIn and sent a message that I used to work with your brand, and I'd love to show you some more ideas. And it did get me into a meeting with awesome. you. Awesome. OK. Any other success story? I, I saw one hand over here. My best student. Any others? Yeah, oh, of course. Is there anybody in between before I walk there? <laughs> No? Nobody ever contacted anyone. Oh, I'm going to give you some ideas. Yeah. Um, I just went, we have a board of trade in Vancouver. So uh -huh. I went to an event because I wanted to um, meet these mining contacts mm. in mining. So mm. if you, you can see who's uh, signed up for the, con for the meetings ahead of time. So you know who's going to be there. Nice. Very nice. OK. Anybody else? Ooh, I'm going to have a lot of ideas to give you. Or you guys are like keeping it close to your chest. You don't want to, you don't want to tell us about it. Uh, we actually design a lot of three-dimensional direct marketing pieces okay. that are specific to certain audiences. And one in particular that we had done was targeted to marketing directors at law firms. Very nice. And uh, the one piece, that, a couple pieces that we sent out, one in particular, one of the recipients said, I've never seen anything like this and actually gave my client a $500,000 budget on a $10 <laughs> marketing nice. piece. Nice. So what was, what was it? Well, it's a little bit involved. It was a creative piece that looked like a little briefcase and it basically had a little note on the top that said the jury is out. You open it up, it says, now you be the judge. Inside there was a little gavel, a little mini file file folder that mm -hmm. said, you know, these are exhibit A, B, and C of our creative marketing. Give us 15 minutes to uh, share our uh, creativity and you be the judge. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, it went over very well. Do you have any idea, I'm going to get technical, what was uh, the price per piece? I do because I built it. It Good. was uh, $10, well, ten dollars a piece. Ten dollars a piece, yep. and how many? Uh, what was the R? So, how many did you send, and what was how many came back? We uh, well, business. in this particular case, the way we designed it, it was designed specifically so that each of the pieces could be branded specifically for the different people in our organization. So they only had to bu purchase a minimum of ten. Okay. So in this particular case, this gentleman ordered ten and got two responses. So a hundred dollar investment got him about. $500,000. <laughs> so the ROI was pretty strong. Pretty good. Yeah. Okay, awesome. That is great. In fact, you are one of my you are one of my tricks and tips that I'm going to give today is the tactile stuff. And I'm actually, you you know. <laughs> no, I love it. And I you know your numbers, which I love. Okay. I'm double miking here. 
All right. So I'm going to give you some clues on how to get in, in the door. One is called interview marketing. And this works really well, and I do this all the time to get in front of buyers. You pick a topic of pain to them that's of importance to them, and you shortlist your target and approach them to say, I'm doing a series of interviews. Now, you can do this interview as written, like journalistic, old, old school. You could do it like video, like I did. And you can cold reach out like I did on LinkedIn, or you could phone. And this works for if you're doing a podcast, if you're doing, and I don't know if your companies will allow you to do any of that, but you can do small scale. You can do it as long as you have approval to do it on your own, just on online. You could do it on Skype, or you can do it on Zoom, which you know you just record the screen. Or you go in person, which is even more effective, but depends on if you're in the same geography. I'm never in the same. I work mostly in the US. So then the content is of relevance to them and to you and to the association and to social media and blah, blah, blah. But really, it's not about that. It's just an excuse to meet them. And I have gotten so much business out of these interviews. And they feel so, I mean, it's not everyone. Some people would rather die than be interviewed, right? But, and, and be you know, visible in any way. But those that have a little bit of a bigger ego are dying to share the secrets of their success about that industry problem. So one for you could be, a topic could be uh, differentiation. Another topic could be, how do you get in front of big corporations? You know, think about all the problems that your industry has that these guys you think are you know, solving. So, and in fact, or their industry, depending on what the industry is, right? It's not about your industry problems. So that's one way. Um, another way that I do this is um, if in conferences. So, for example, or events. I'm putting on an event in Houston at the end of this month, and I'm interviewing people I want to come to that meeting on Zoom, and we're posting it onto... Uh, social media. So, for example, I'm uh, my target are small business women business owners who are WBEs. That's what they're called, and there I'm targeting them to come to that meeting. So they're doing interviews with me. There's no way they'd give me, you know, time of day, if at that conference or at that big event, if I didn't have that one-on-one -on -one with them. So then when I go to the event, they actually like, hey, we're friends now. Okay, executive roundtables. This is how we met. Uh, with Jay, and so it's an intimate group of eight high-level decision makers, and I use these all the time. In fact, this is the way that I grew my business in the U.S., and I didn't know a single human being in the U.S., not even a Jack Russell, and I was able to uh, completely, you know, now I've shifted 90% of my business to the U.S., and it's all virtual. Like, I got stopped at the Nexus like, last time I was going through. And, the, you know, the, the guy said, no, 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 you need a visa. And it's not true because it's all virtual. So if I can do it and I can do it in the U.S., you can do it anywhere. So what you have to do is get, first of all, you have to get real specific and clear on who your target is and what problem they have that you solve. Then that's the title of the roundtable. Then you invite executives or your target into the room to have a confidential, high-level conversation about this. So, for example, mine was similar to this topic, how to reach corporate decision makers quickly. And I invited small business owners to this roundtable. And in fact, that was, um, that was a roundtable we did before Accelerate. So I do it before conferences. So if my target is having a conference, I do it like day zero of the registration. And then, I invite them, and sometimes the people who can't even come become clients because you've engaged them already. And you've become a thought leader by addressing the pain and by putting on this whole huge event. And sometimes, many of the times, I get the conference organizers to fill the room. Many times, I get the conference organizers to give me a room. If I don't, then I just rent a Regis, you know, intelligent office, something, and then I'm able to get all those people together and I facilitate a discussion about the pain. How did you do? You know, what, what do you think about that? And what worked for you and what didn't work for you? So, and we sign NDAs and it's all above board and there's no selling and there's no fee. So, 
one of the biggest things I believe is selling without selling. And it's all about, you know, you're giving value. You're giving value and you're demonstrating thought leadership. That's it. And then um, media appearances. I don't know if you have the ability or, I mean, it, it's hard. It's, it's not easy. I cold called my way into these gigs. I, I hired a guy to help teach me how to do that in the US. And if you're interested in that, I'll give you all the uh, information for him. But it, it works because how I use them or if you have any type of, if you know any producers in your market that do morning television or any, even smaller markets, you can just try and cold call with an interesting um, subject. Then what you can say is, I'm going to be in your area doing a television appearance. Do you have an hour to talk about you know, your business? Works much better than without the TV. Because with the TV, you have credibility, you have you know, thought leadership, you have, you have, you have, you have. Because if you were crazy, they wouldn't let you on TV. And then, of course, they could, you know, the guy could, you know, give you at least an hour of his time. And <laughs> maybe they let you on TV, even if you are crazy, right? Um, and here's the tactile piece that the gentleman in the back was talking about. One of the, my client's kick, we sent Smucker's Jam Company a, uh, a toaster, like a real toaster. And in it, fake bread, you can't see, it, but it's a toaster. It said, David Kick would like to propose a toast. Let's meet up for a jam session. And they actually got the business because tactile works. Now, you may not have the budget or the creativity, but it doesn't even have to be that clever. Um, sometimes I send a, a Cutco knife. I think it's $350, right? And I say, do you want to carve out some time for me? You know, cute, stupid stuff, uh, if it's relevant to them, even better, right? If it's relevant to their problem or to their industry. But again, like you have to figure out the industry, and then you have to figure out what is the pain to that industry. And then um, if you remember when I said that you would work with other people in the same industry who have the same target but who have a different positioning, well, this is what I do is something called conference coaching. So I have all these other different subject matter experts that I hire and together we walk in and we hold a whole conference corner with all these different um, on the spot 20 minute coaching sessions that people sign up for on that board. And not only do you get uh, listed as a resource and a speaker at the conference, but also you are able to uh, you know, say to whoever you're trying to target, hey, are you going to be at the show? Come check out where I'm going to be. Same with trade shows, you guys. I mean, I work a lot um, with trade shows. The HRPA trade show, if you're from Toronto, was just um, this past week, I think. And one of my clients, uh, what we changed was, one, the banner changed. And oh, I have such a, so much to say about banners. Don't let it be a poster. It has to have a billboard stopping effect of just that one big image, one big message, and it has to be based on their pain. So the client was a um, uh, pre-employment checking company, and they were listing all their services. We do criminal checking and social media and blah, 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 and we changed it to a, a guy in a business suit with a white mask, and it said, um, candidates lie uncover the true candidate and then their logo. And they got so much feedback and they got so much business out of that. And then we changed a whole, whole other few things. Um, we printed up a tip sheet made out of five things your pre-screeners are missing that's costing you thousands of dollars. So just that thought leadership, it's just a postcard. And they got so much mileage out of calling before the trade show to cue people up to come and pick up the, the you know, collateral, and then to engage with them and set appointments, and then afterwards to say, hey, did you get the postcard? You missed it. Now, you guys are in the promotional uh, products where, you know, wherever I go to trade shows, um, the, the, this last one was done at um, meeting, uh, meeting professionals. Uh, so uh, what is it called? Incentive Works. So at Incentive Works, I don't know how many of you exhibit at in Incentive Works. You do, right? So it, it's it's just like as far as the eye can see of you know promotional products in one part. The other part is meeting planners, but uh, there's nothing different about them. There's really nothing different about them. So if you want to be different, you have to use these tactics that I'm telling you of first getting your message right, first getting your targeting right, and then. Um, 
coming up with tactics to help them solve that problem because it's not just a pen's a pen's a pen, right? Okay, um, here's another example that I love to show. Here's Jay's book and um, sensory media. Jay, do you want to say a couple of words about how that worked out for your business? Is it too new to talk about? Here, I'll bring you the microphone. You might be asking yourself, what's a promotional company, product company doing launching a, a book, right? You might be asking that. Yeah, so tell us, what was the, uh, you know, the effect of this book launch? So this is, this is kind of surprised to see this on the screen for starters. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, we did, this wasn't we didn't cute, yeah, yeah, yeah. she didn't, didn't pay it. me. <laughs> um, yeah, so sensory media, uh, I just, I uh, study human behavior, I study the mind, I study um, the effects of promotional products on people. So in a bigger way to uh, study conditioning in that, but when I realized over the last 20 years of working with promotional products that were sensory beings, uh, I went from calling promotional products communication tools to calling them sensory media, realizing the impact of promotional products. So, so the book really is, um, it probably took 18 months to compile, even though it was 20 years of, of thought and stories and research. But it, it definitely legitimized uh, my my uh, conversation with my clients so that when when you are published and you're positioned as a thought leader they see that you know what you're talking about and they welcome they welcome you in now obviously there's lots of history and stories and stuff in it and and I Charlie knows that um, and I, you all do too that I wrote the book now the book is was launched three years ago and I wrote the book for the industry yeah my name is on it but there's no contact information and anybody is welcome to use that book in any circumstance nice. any place in the industry Very that they nice. want to so, that is very generous. Yeah, so that's great. You. And I also, I also saw your event. That's like I was blown away with Michelle Bailey. That's, oh, that's, that's how did it go? Yeah, yeah. There was also an event, guys. If you think a right. promotional product company is doing events of education that have to do with with the book, right? Right. And it was book number three, which is I write something called Aha Moment Mondays, and some of you see it. It's on uh, the weekly that the PPPC puts out, um, and that started as a way of just staying in touch with my clients in a non-sales way. So it's just some, um, it's you know perspectives on situations that happen in the industry and how to respond to them and you know I'd get them thinking a little bit deeper so I took a number of the ahas and put them into a book created a journal from it um, so that it would create breakthroughs and deeper thinking so it's a it's a very general personal development tool it doesn't necessarily relate to the industry but what I did for the launch of the book last week is I brought as you know I know you have put people around the table I brought experts in in a multitude of disciplines to do with January goals so I had um, four who were live Michelle Bailey as you mentioned who is a, a local um, entrepreneur very successful uh, business person in the agency world um, emceed it and then I had a doctor who just, uh, talks about neuroplasticity Skype in from Spain I had a psychiatrist Skype in from Florida and then I had a couple people with recorded messages and the others deliver seminars so when you bring all of these experts together it really supports the message that you're giving as well as again position you as a you know a powerful leader in that field yeah, yeah. thank you so much thank so that's so much. great i didn't know i didn't plant her it's thank you yeah awesome so you know what i i guess what you guys are thinking let me ask you a, for a show of hands how many of you have the ability to change uh your marketing okay well i don't know right because uh, you may not have, you, you may have a template and you have to use that. So there's a couple of you. For the rest of you, there is still hope. You know why? Because I work with sales reps um, who are just working on their own. And even if you change your emails to being, if you just do the thinking and think about who are you targeting, and even if you don't uh, pick an industry, look at what industry they're already in, who you're going to talk to, and then think of, do some Google work, do some research about what are they struggling with that you can help solve or one of your products can help solve. And then change your emails and your voicemails and everything you have to be a solution to that. Create, write something, find something that somebody else has written to send them. So that's the way you ask to open the door, to open the conversation is, did you know? 
whatever the, pro the, the problem statistic is. Open the conversation with, did you know that in your industry, four out of five are struggling with retention? Did you know that, you know, whatever the problem is. So do the homework and then try to call and try to prepare something, even if you're not allowed to prepare it yourself. My financial uh, clients are always like, oh, we're not allowed to do anything. Well, find something that somebody else has done and then be a resource for them and that's the way you can get in. Okay, so I guess one more example is uh, this, I, I liked it because this company called Talbot, yeah, they won a lot of awards and it's about them, which I don't typically like, but what I liked about it is when I went onto their website, it wasn't a throw up of product. So usually in your industry, that's all it is, is just as soon as I go onto the, to the main homepage, that's all I see is just product and you know some form of very small banner messaging. So that's why I liked it was different. So the next step is, if you think anything that I've said has any bearing on what you do and that you think I can help you or your company, I'm going to have, I'm going to be here at the show. There's this sign up sheet with your, you put your name and there's dates and times and there's three, one, two, three, four times here right now where we're gonna go into another room. So sign up and uh, circulate this. If you think this could help you, if you think your company can use this kind of help, or if you can use this kind of help, please go ahead and sign up. And the rest of them, we will uh, have a phone or a video conversation. And I'm here again tomorrow. How many of you are here tomorrow? Oh, everybody. Well, kind of everybody, yeah. But it's, I think it's gonna be a different crowd in my room. And it is a different topic. It's actually elevator pitches tomorrow. Ooh. And that, I'm going to actually give the microphone. Like, half of it is going to be um, experiential, that one. So anyway, come back. That's going to be a, a good one. It's a doozy. Um, I'm doing that a lot in the US now. So yeah, and then if there's no room, uh, put your card, and put your card anyway, because I won't be able to read your writing. So if, circulate if you're not interested. And now we can do our draw, yeah, yeah, the trip, the trip to Hawaii, yeah, yeah, here's, okay, that's right, I know, you know, we're going to uh, Jamaica um, next week, but everybody's like, oh my god, there's a travel warning, I'm like, what, you don't have to tell me that now, there's no way I can get my money back, Laura, do you want to draw, sure. do, wait, does everybody have their card in here, this is um, a, my book, the gentle marketing and uh, chocolates, which you know makes the book go down easier, <laughs> I guess. So if uh, you you don't have yours, right? So I'll just get yours. And anybody else? And of course, I'm going to keep in touch with you. Can't do that. Can't leave you alone. If you, if you give me your card, you got yours, yeah. You didn't put it at the beginning. You didn't think I had anything good to say. No, I'm kidding. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, Laura, close your eyes. I already have your book. Yeah. Ooh, it's uh, Sandy Wong. Nice. That is a gorgeous picture, yeah. Sandy Wong. Wow. All right. Great Thank photo. you. Okay, Sandy. Well, I'm going to call you to see what you think about the chocolate and uh, the book. Okay, does anybody have any questions? We're like five minutes. I'm doing good time management. Congratulations. First of all, how many people are already doing all this stuff? Yeah, oh, the gentleman in the back, hold on. No, 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 I like, I like microphones. I wrote a blog about this, I can't let you do. I said, if ever you're offered a microphone and you say, the room can hear me, right? I'm like, yeah. So one of the things that I think your folks in the room should understand is this whole idea and premise about vertical markets. The one thing that wasn't said is your profitability will explode if you start going vertical. Nice. I promise you. To the point where a lot of people in this industry are committed to 32 to 35 percent gross profit. And I can tell you where I've seen 60 percent gross profit when you go vertical. Wow. And why, what's the primary reason for that? You're an expert. Right. Bottom, oh bottom my line. God! Can I quote you? Like you, may. you have to. Well, you have to tell me your name. Well, you have my <laughs> well out of the, you know, whatever. The, is your picture on it? No. <laughs> okay. Seriously? <laughs> a 
that's a cool name. All right. Um, so any questions, anyone? It's always, I'm, I'm here for those of you who are shy like me and if your mother had to send you to the corner store like, <laughs> they, like she did with me. So all I'll say is the, the hardest part of change is uh, not making the same choices yesterday. So if you walk out of here and do exactly what you've been doing, you know, you've just wasted your hour. And I'm sorry for you, but I can't really help <laughs> if that's the case. And um, thank you so much. You've been a lovely, if quiet, audience. Thank you.